webinar invest, investing and planning for turbulent times. I am Yvonne Diaz Clays, and I'm honored to serve as a member of the Horizon Foundation Board of Directors. And I'm also the president and CEO of a nonprofit organization, HISPA. Our mission is to inspire Latino students to discover their potential and to ignite their desire to embrace education and achieve success. We are so happy you chose to join us for this very important conversation. As a leader of a nonprofit, I value opportunities like this one to learn and to hear from the experts who understand the challenges and the opportunities of nonprofit management. All of us at the Horizon Foundation are excited to offer this webinar because we know your work is critical and we want to help you continue to be successful addressing the needs of our New Jersey community. It is an honor to introduce Linda Sipo, President and CEO of the New Jersey Center for Nonprofits. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone at Horizon and the Horizon Foundation for your strong support of the nonprofit community in New Jersey and of the New Jersey Center for Nonprofits. We are so happy to partner with you today on today's webinar, and we're so glad to see so many people joining today. For those of you who don't know the New Jersey Center for Nonprofits, we are New Jersey's statewide nonprofit network and champion for the charitable community. For 40 years, through advocacy, education, and services, the center has existed to elevate and assist nonprofits in service to the community to improve the quality of life for all people of our state. One of our signature programs is our annual New Jersey Nonprofit Conference, which convenes more than 500 nonprofit leaders, professional staff, volunteers, and allies to learn, make connections, and be inspired. After two years of convening virtually, we will be back in person on December 7th, so visit our website for more information, uh, and we thank the Horizon Foundation for supporting the event. If you'd like to learn more about our programs, about membership, or how we can be of help to you, please visit our website and, or contact us. Today's topic, investing and planning for turbulent times, is especially timely. In today's volatile environment, the work of nonprofits in providing essential programs and services and safe spaces for people to come together for community solutions is more important than ever. The human, societal, and economic devastation of the pandemic is still unfolding and won't be fully known for many years. But while there is no way, there was no way to anticipate the magnitude of this crisis, it's clear that the organizations that had stronger systems, plans, and finances in place when the pandemic hit were better positioned to navigate the turbulence. And while we certainly hope that the worst is behind us, we still have a long road ahead. It's vital that we act on what we've learned so far and do what we can to be prepared moving forward. So I know that you are as excited as I am to hear the insights of today's panel. It's now my pleasure to turn things over to Jonathan Pearson, Executive Director of the Horizon Foundation, to kick off the discussion. John? Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Yvonne, Linda, and Danielle for your help in organizing today's webinar. We're really excited, as uh, Linda just mentioned, to cover this very important topic. And we have some terrific experts in finance uh, that are going to join us here today. Uh, the goal for today, really to be productive, practical, provide useful information to help build your organizational capacity and your success as you move forward. This topic um, has been of high interest of many nonprofits and really everyone in general, uh, with a particular focus on earned income, endowments, and like many of us, how are we planning for the recession or possible recession, soaring inflation, labor shortages that may impact your organization and market volatility. So given these headwinds, our four experts um, will provide guidance on how to best prepare for economic uncertainty and financial challenges and opportunities. So a couple of housekeeping updates. We're going we're gonna to have each presenter uh, come on. They have about 10 minutes or so to give their presentation. We'll have time for questions at the end of all four presentations. If you did submit a question in advance, um, we will get to that and or the chat function. Uh, so please, um, you know, fill the chat function up with questions. Uh, and we will also share each presentation um, and the presenter's bios at the conclusion of today's webinar. So let's, let's jump in so you can hear first from uh, Frank Malaccio. Frank is Vice President and Treasurer at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. Frank has been with the company since 2017 
and he's he's responsible for billions of dollars uh, in corporate pension and foundation investments. And I only smile because that's a it's a huge responsibility. Frank does an amazing job. Um, he manages liquidity, financial arrangements, corporate insurance programs, and also the investment program. We're really glad to have Frank here. He supports the foundation as well and members of his team. So with that, Frank, I'll turn it over to you to get us started. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Um, and really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Uh, you know, John and I work very closely on the foundation. And so I think a lot of the work that we've done in the foundation is what I'm going to talk through. Um, and we were just recently talking about our spending rules. So a lot of what I'm going to just talk about on this slide here um, is relevant to how we function every single day. So I think the first thing that people fail to do when they're coming up with their how they're thinking about investing and running their organization um, assets is not defining the objective. And so while it sounds very basic, that's the most important thing in my mind that you do is what, are, what is the objective here? Is the objective to grow your investment funds over a long period of time and you do not need money from the investment portfolio to operate? Do you need a portion of that investment por uh, portfolio to operate each year? So defining what you're trying to achieve and then using that as the basis to define where you should be investing and how much risk you should take is really the cornerstone. So some, depending on the size of the organization, Maybe that makes sense. You know, maybe you need to sit down with operational people and say, okay, how much revenue do we have coming in and charitable contributions for the period? And then, you know, what are our ongoing expenses? Do we have any large expenses? And using that budget to say, hey, we have a funding cap here and we always expect to have a funding gap and we expect that funding cap to be X dollars and that will need to come every single period from our, uh, whether it's an endowment foundation, whatever that may be, that's gonna come from the investment portfolio. That's going to be very helpful when you're thinking about where you want to be invested, because the worst thing that you can do is selling investments at, a, at an inopportune time, especially with all the market volatility today. And so if you structure your investment portfolio in a way that you'll always have that liquidity available every single year when you need it, you won't have to force sell everything. In fact, you, it doesn't matter what happens in the financial markets on a short-term basis, you'll be able to sustain yourself. So making sure from the, the first thing you do is setting up what is the plan, come up with dollars that you'll need for liquidity, and then start building around that. Also, you need to think about how much risk you are willing to take. So a lot of people kind of jump to the return requirement um, right away. I would say you actually want to start with risk before you talk about return, because how much risk you're willing to take will actually determine how much return you're going to be able to generate. So you know, think about what would make you uncomfortable. Do you have certain financial commitments? Do our, our individuals that contribute to your organization, would they be nervous if they saw the, um, the foundation drop by more than 10% of its assets in any given period? So frame that up and think about what is acceptable to you in any given period. Um, keep in mind the assets that are going to have longer, re uh, better returns like stocks, um, they're going to have more volatility as we've seen. And so if you are not able to take a lot more risk, you're probably going to have less in the way of, of stocks. So I think that's really important. What's your current financial condition? Um, you know, when you're thinking about that risk, also think about can you, you know, what, what, is, what would this mean for your operations if that, that amount dropped by 30%? Um, do you, do you have certain stakeholders? Are you overseen by another organization? Do they expect you to have a certain amount of low risk investments in a capital stock? So really defining that um, is critically important. Um, and I talked about this also when I talked about the objectives, but those operating requirements and the cash objectives are, are really important. So you next, once you've defined all of the, I would say the basic components that you need, and you know, just as a good order of practice, if you don't have an investment policy statement, I definitely recommend it. Because in the investment policy statement, that's where you as an organization will define your objective, your return requirements, and your risks. And there's a variety of ways you can go about figuring out the optimal portfolio. And, and many of you probably work with external organizations to help do that. But if you're not talking about risk, you're not going to get that, that return objective. 
So now we kind of, we, we've done the work, we have the investment policy statement. What do we do? How do we move forward? Well, you want to figure out how are you going to optimize and create your asset classes? And that's what you'll work with an, an, another party. And there's a ver variety of models and you can even use things online to help you do that and craft that. But when you're thinking about your operating requirements, you know, many of one of the worst things that has happened to us in the financial markets is that your bond portfolio is probably down almost as much as your, your stock portfolio. And so for those of you that have experienced, usually the bond portfolio is supposed to do well when the stock portfolio is not doing so well and vice versa. And so we're at a point in time right now where both stocks and bonds are falling. Um, Luckily, equity markets are doing a little bit better right now, but it's been it's been a rough road uh, on a year to day basis. And so if you don't have that benefit of having the stocks and bonds balance out, you, you felt a lot more pain than you probably normally would have. And this is a perfect storm um, for many asset classes right now. So if you're feeling nervous uh, and uncomfortable, you're not alone. All investors are going through that. But there is one bright spot here. You have interest rates that are the highest they've been in a long period of time. And so when you're thinking about your liquidity, if you need to hold some extra cash, you could have short-term treasury bills that are earning 4% right now. Um, and so there are great options that are very relatively risk-free. Um, you can even have corporate bonds that are very high quality earning something above and beyond that. So use this opportunity as you're going through that liquidity to take advantage of those higher, higher bond rates. And you can actually map out. So if you know for the next five years, you're going to need X dollars in each of the years. You can just align some bonds to those, to, to those years where you know you need that, uh, those funds and you'll earn a nice return. So we're out of the zero interest rate environment. So try to take advantage of that. Um, and, and so you'll address the liquidity issue and you'll also help with your return process. Um, the other thing I would just point out is a lot of times as you're looking through your investment portfolio, whether you look through it monthly, quarterly, semi-annually, whatever, whatever is right, I'd say probably at least quarterly is a good way to look at it. Um, don't always look at return, also look at risk. And, and unfortunately, oftentimes when you're doing that, that's not part of the discussion, but I would encourage you as part of your quarterly reviews, always figure out what are the key risk metrics that you wanna look at and determine whether or not the risk profile has shifted. One of the things that's happened in the bond market, I won't go into bond math and bore everybody with it, but bonds were actually significantly um, riskier in recent years than they have historically been because the coupons on bonds were very low and um, the, the risk sensitivity measure actually increased. So you could think you have the same asset class, but the, actually the risks are growing over time. And so incorporating that risk management is really important as you're going through it because it'll help you understand whether or not you're being compensated for the risks that you're taking and whether or not they're in line with your investment policy statement objective. And finally, determine what your spending rule is. How do you go about that? Well, basically look at what your average assets are. Now, don't go off any one year um, because you're gonna have market volatility. You wanna be invested over a long-term cycle, but take the average over, let's say a three-year average of your assets um, and say, okay, I will only spend, let's say 5%, 8% or something like that. That's absolutely critical. So I would say that, you know, if you create that level of discipline in how you run your um, foundation, endowment, whatever it may be, that will be really critical in making sure you're not spending down your investment. And as you're going through these market cycles, which are not going to stop, we're going to continue to have volatility, you will be able to not worry because you know you've planned for it, you can stick to that script and you have that spending role. And so don't, you know, by, by doing the homework ahead of time, by mapping out your level of comfort and risk, and by making sure you have sufficient liquidity, you won't really worry about whether or not there's a downturn market, however that may last, whether that's a couple of months, a year, or even two years, um, because you've done the work ahead of time, you've planned for it. So uh, with that, um, I guess, uh, hand it off either to Tom or John, if you're gonna come back on. Great, thank you, Frank. Appreciate it, great commentary. We did have one question in chat. We'll get to that um, at the conclusion of the presenter. So next we'd like to introduce Tom Bartlett. Uh, Tom is co-founder and president of 20 Degrees, a not a, an organization that helps nonprofits, social enterprises and childcare providers build financial resilience in new forms of revenue and equipping leaders with the tools to navigate the future. 
Uh, Tom's background and career, he started um, building his career at a Fortune 50 company, recognized um, in the CSR space as a leader for over 15 years, and I'm really glad to have him here today. So Tom, with that, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Uh, it's a joy to uh, be with all of you. As, uh, as Jonathan shared, uh, I come to this work having been formerly a funder, uh, but we started our firm 20 Degrees to help organizations really think about the question uh, that has brought us all here to this webinar, how to plan through uncertainty and what to do about uh, your what to do with your strategy and how to bring money in, even when things feel uh, very unpredictable. So we think about sustainability across three primary uh, pillars. And the first is access to long-term flexible capital. We think Predictable income streams uh, are vital to supporting the underlying revenue needs of an organization and access to strategic tools that allow for leaders to plan through, you know, headwinds, maybe tailwinds, uh, and so that our organizations are always positioned best for, they, for where they need to be. I would argue that the, the long-term flexible capital uh, piece is a little outside the controls often for organizational leaders, particularly for smaller non nonprofits, um, and probably best left to a different conversation. But if you do have this capital stream, it's something that can, just as we heard from, from Frank, can really help with thinking through how to support cash needs an organization might, might need. It can allow you to make strategic investments uh, when, when needed. And if you don't have this capital uh, at this point, it's something that as we talk more about how, to, how we bring more revenue in, that surplus funding can go to help build this long-term capital uh, access through reserves or through endowments over time. And so this can be a, an aspirational thing to build for leaders who may not have this in place right, right now. So many of many organizations we know don't, but would just offer it's a goal to build toward um, at, at any point in, in time. But let's focus most of our energy today on this building of predictable income. And why do we care about predictability? Well, in a time of real big un uncertainty, we often hear that diversification matters. And, and we certainly agree, and that's part of what we do. We help organizations build earned income and all kinds of different philanthropic or contributed income streams. But we also really help groups think about which of these streams are gonna bring in the most level of predictability. And when we think about right now, the environment we're in, we're seeing foundation assets overall dropping, even by the best, uh, by the best work that Frank and others who are managing investments portfolios, we're seeing drops in portfolios of 15 to 20% on, on average, which really reduces the grant making power a lot of foundations are gonna have. And that multi-year grant funding and even renewals are a little bit more uh, uncertain than they, than they may be. Similar things are happening in the individual small donor space. We're seeing that indications for the year end might not be as, uh, as great as they were year over year. So as leaders, what do we do with this information? One of the things that we would offer is first look to some of the other streams where there are uh, hopefully some better si uh, signals and some, some more predictability. So government contracting is a, is a place actually with a lot of the, the funding that's coming in through a lot of federal stimulus and other local uh, efforts. There is some, some higher contracting activity that can bring more predictability. Um, earned income is our favorite form of predictable income. Um, and the latter often offers you much greater autonomy than some of the other streams because any earned income coming in is unrestricted. And you as leaders can then deploy it across your organizations however you see fit. Well, uh, if, if you are wondering where can you begin to think about how to drive uh, different types of diversification or thinking about how even to begin building earned income, where we would have you start is to really think about the overall value proposition that your organizations are delivering to beneficiaries, but also to customers, and I'm using that term intentionally for our earned income streams, as well as with donors. And one of the things that can be helpful is to really break down our organizations on a program by program basis when doing a little bit of uh, the next exercises that I'll describe here in a, in a moment. Um, by thinking about our, our business in its component parts, it allows us to really think a bit more deeply about how each of those different program areas, maybe we call them business lines, are operating 
in our current environment and maybe what might happen to them in a future environment. And so the first thing that we would have, uh, we would encourage folks to do is to conduct an exercise, maybe bring your leadership team in and really try to get inside the, the shoes um, and get the perspective of your donors, your customers, again, if you have an earned income stream um, and think about the problem that you are, are solving through their eyes. How would they answer that the current problem is, is being perceived or felt by, by them? And how is your service or solution helping to meet those pain points that they may be experiencing along the way? And if you see any gaps, what are some of the things that you might be able to do to adjust either your program model or even how you're talking about your program delivery? Are you meeting the, the needs that your different constituencies are feeling in this moment? Stepping back again and looking at the different uh, business lines, we then would say another great exercise to do is to do a profitability analysis, which I know is a weird term to talk about in our nonprofit uh, setting here. Um, but as we all know, it's okay for nonprofits to turn a profit. It's what we're doing with that profit that you know uh, classifies or puts us into this classification. So we would offer that doing a, a profitability analysis across the different program areas will give you all uh, as leaders an ability to see which of your programs are actually bringing in uh, certain types of revenue um, and how much subsidy from your unrestricted reserves or just unrestricted income coming in is needed to keep those programs moving. And it's not to say that all of our programs need to be making profit. What we are, uh, what hopefully can become illuminated through this type of activity is to see which of these program areas actually might even be so uh, strong and so powerful that it's subsidizing all the rest of the different program areas. And maybe there's a need to double down more or to strengthen some of the other business lines or our program areas um, accordingly. One of the things that uh, can be a really powerful exercise if you've done both the profitability analysis and this value proposition exercise is to step back and see if there's alignment. Are you seeing that in areas where you have a stronger value proposition, are you seeing that you're also uh, have stronger revenue performance? And I think that's an interesting question for us to hold. Are we communicating well? Are we building programs that are really responding to what our customers, what our donors, but ultimately what our beneficiaries need in this moment and is that translating into revenue performance? So then stepping to uh, strategic tools, one of the most important things that we would offer that leaders can do, particularly in a time of uncertainty, of what we're all facing kind of right now, is deploying some, some, um, common, some common methods to be able to plan for the future. So scenario planning and financial modeling are two practices that are the most uh, that are really, really important, probably one of the most important things that you can do. These often though feel intimidating. We work with a lot of organizational leaders who don't know where to begin or feel overwhelmed even hearing those, those phrases. And what we would offer is that um, one, lean on your boards, lean on your other uh, network of, of volunteers, people who might have this expertise that can sit alongside you and your leadership teams uh, to do some of this, this work. At the end of the day, scenario planning is storytelling. It's looking out over the next year, two years, five years, and really thinking what might happen in a certain storyline. And what would our organization, what does our organization need to do in order to play out the story or adapt as that storyline changes? And scenario planning tools, there's a, a few, and I'm happy to chat offline about some that, that we like in particular to help with that. Financial modeling is the component part of that. It also can feel intimidating. And so lean on your finance committee, lean on other volunteers you might have if you don't have this capability in-house. But it's a really great way to see how certain assumptions and decisions we're making now are going to affect the financial performance if certain things do happen. And that way then we can have better and more informed conversations as leaders so that we're not just talking in abstraction, that we can actually put together our strategies and know that these are likely going to be some of the financial uh, consequences or opportunities if we move forward. So hopefully this helps paint a bit of a picture of some of the uh, techniques and the strategies that you can deploy to hopefully build more sustainability into your model, even through uncertainty.
And with that, I'll toss it back to you, Jonathan. Great, thank you so much, Tom. Appreciate it. We are excited to have our next speaker. Um, her name is Rupal Shaw. She is principal and head of PGIM, fixed income insurance uh, client advisory. Rupal is tasked with partnering with the head of insurance strategy to drive third party insurance efforts and grow PGIM's third party insurance footprint. Her responsibilities are vast, they include business development, client service, and product strategy. So we're really Honored to have her here and join us, and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, John, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so my name is Rupal Shah. I work at PGM Fixed Income. Um, we are a public fixed income shop. So uh, like uh, all investors and, and all of our clients, everybody's withstanding an extremely volatile, bumpy ride this year. Um, and so we've been navigating that and really there's various things that as an investor you want to think about as you're thinking about your portfolio. Um, and you know in this environment and Frank talked about this earlier most investors have not seen these types of interest rates, you know, in their careers and investors have not experienced this. Um, so as painful as it could feel right now in your portfolios, you really could use that um, as well as opportunities when you're thinking about the future and the benefits that those higher interest rates can provide to you and your portfolio. Um, so a few things that I've noted here on this slide and really some of the things that as um, an investor of your um, your funds that you could think about. And, and I work with a couple charities and they do have different liquidity needs and really thinking about you know, what are your liquidity needs right now, right? So coming up with that investment policy statement that Frank also was talking a lot about and really sticking to that investment policy statement, um, which will include what your cash needs are, right? So what are you trying to achieve with your investments? What is your time horizon? Um, and this is what your inv investment policy will state. Um, and your entire organization, you know, all the folks that are involved with collectively agreeing to that investment policy statement, the board of directors and whomever is agreeing to that, will need to be okay with, you know, what the risks are within the portfolio. What is the time horizon? What volatility would you be able to withstand, especially in these markets that we've been living through? Um, and, and how the reaction would be, right? Because if you are a long-term investor, despite the fact that you are seeing large losses um, that obviously are very uncomfortable to everybody, but you're seeing these large losses in your portfolio. However, if you have a long horizon to your investments and you're not realizing the lo these losses by selling what you own, um, you know, if you if you trust the person that's investing in these asset classes, you know likely they're going to be able to withstand the test of time. So unless you're selling these assets um, and fixed income, you know this holds true for what we're investing in. The bonds that we own are going to be money good in the future, right? So these are unrealized losses in the current state. Um, so if you are a long horizon, long uh, have a long horizon in terms of your investments, then do not emotionally sell in these markets. It's important that you hold on to those because in that investment policy statement, you now have stated that you do not need these assets or these funds right now. Um, however, in some of these, uh, these not-for-profits that I have worked with, cash needs are right now. And so if you know that you need these cash needs um, and they, you need to be putting them to work, what is the time frame that you need that? And it's really having a good projection around, okay, it's right now within the month, quarter, by the end of the year, and having that as a cash ladder so you understand what your requirements are and your liabilities are, and for you to match that, right? And so thinking about, okay, I need my cash at these time periods. This is how I will plan to invest. And if it's you know, not going to be palatable to have losses in these portfolios because the cash needs are, you know, imminent, um, then that is what you would include in this investment policy statement. And really sticking to that is important because knowing what your liabilities are at the time frame you need them um, is really going to ultimately lead to the most long-term success and ongoing success um, of your fund. So, um, you know, it really is volatile and turbulent in terms of the times we're living through right now. We're all withstanding that. 
Um, but you know, picking the right asset classes where you're monitoring that risk is really going to help ultimately meet your objectives um, in your investments. Um, now, you know, we've had a couple of these uh, turbulent times, right? We went through COVID, um, and now we're going through this just a couple of years later. Um, you know, we've also gone through uh, even worse times theoretically with the greater financial crisis, but we've all been able to get through those times because we've thought about what um, our investment needs are and our, our cash flow needs are and what that impact will be. So, um, you know, as, uh, as Tom and Frank were saying, we will get through this by, by planning, staying consistent, um, and really sticking to the time to kind of what your plan is. Um, and so uh, some of the things that we think about in terms of investments, you know, bonds really are a great way to want something really low in risk that right now. However, the yields are really high. And so if you have higher quality bond investments and there's various options that you can use to capture that type of yield, these are higher quality bond investments. So they, you know, um, in, in with good managers, those will pay out, right? So you just have to capture those yields and kind of stick to um, the investment. Um, and, at, you know, they will pay the coupons over time. And, you know, hopefully at the end of that, you're going to receive your principal back. So these are really great investments for the higher yields. We have not seen these types of yields in these markets for bond investments. Um, so, you know, it's, it's looking for those kind of lower risk type investments, depending on what you're looking for. Um, you know, some of what we've done and some of the nonprofits that I've worked for is um, for cash that we did not need CDs, right? You can right now and looking at some of the yields that you can get, they're very low risk or to essentially no risk. Um, but again, you're then locking up your investments um, but that's, you know, basically what you need to determine as a part of your investment policy statement. Um, so with that, I uh, really appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to answering any questions that you have. And I will uh, pass it back to John. Great. Thank you so much. And we have our, our fourth uh, speaker today, presenter today. Um, last, but certainly not least, I uh, would like to introduce uh, Lennon Register, Vice President and CEO of the New Jersey Performing Arts Center in the great city of Newark, New Jersey, where Horizon has been headquartered since 1932. Sorry, I had to get a little plug in for the company. Um, serving in his role since 2015, he oversees financial operations, reporting, information technology, risk management, and a whole host of other things at NJ PAC. So with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to you and we are uh, looking forward to your presentation. Okay, thank you, Jonathan, and uh, uh, welcome everyone. So uh, one of the uh, significant challenges in planning for turbulent times is accepting that planning usually doesn't take place until you're in the middle of a crisis, because uh, most business challenges do not announce themselves in advance. So, you know, looking back at January 2020, few of us could have imagined that a virus could shut down businesses globally, but it did and nothing prepared me for this reality. Uh, my only option was to prepare for the worse. So as illustrated in the upper right graph, NJ Pack was experiencing five consecutive years of revenue growth as we expanded our business opportunities beyond our usual performances. We created a touring production that performed throughout the United States and a performance in Russia, we increased the number of large capacity shows at offside venues, including shows at the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, and we pursued opportunities to host television broadcasts at our facility. All was advancing well until March 2020 and the elimination of all forms of earned revenue, the possibilities of significant losses in our endowment investments, and a decline in donor support. All these factors had the potential to take our gross revenues from $49 million in 2019 to $14 million by 2023. These were plausible outcomes that we had to prepare for. Strategically, we had to remain financially viable by controlling what we could. 
In the short term, it required that we borrow from our endowment investments and renegotiate debt payments to conserve cash flow. We controlled overhead expenses with staff reductions and pay cuts, and we focused on donor relationships to ensure timely payments on existing pledges. Equally important was to remain focused on our mission. In hard times, no organization can afford to stop being who they are. Our mission required us to be a vital part of the community, and that was increasingly important during the pandemic. Everyone knew that the pandemic would end, but we didn't know when or if our financial resources could sustain us over the long period. So cultivating trust that we could navigate this storm was essential to retaining talent. And lastly, we always remained positive. We did this every day and in many ways to instill confidence that this too shall pass. I can summarize our results with an old sports saying, the harder we worked, the luckier we got. Because in the beginning, we had no idea that we would receive over $15 million of federal, state, and donor support from the Paycheck Protection Program, the Shutters Venues Program, the state of New Jersey, and our generous donor base. So the combination of these and active expense management put us in a good place. We ended the fiscal year, the fiscal year with a record surplus, and this allowed us to better secure our future by repaying the endowment loans taken at the beginning of the pandemic and to pay down long-term debt. Our newly created virtual programs allowed more residents to participate in events and arts education program, and we never stopped advancing our real estate projects including developing new residential and retail units in our adjacent lots, advancing the construction of a new arts education facility, and construction of a film studio in North South Ward. However, the workplace has changed and employee retention continues to be a challenge. So for me, the key takeaway is that turbulent times will come, as they did in 2008 with the financial crisis, and in 2020 with the pandemic. So when they come, I am convinced that the best solutions are rooted in, common, in a common sense approach. Thank you all and back to you, John. Great, thank you so much. And I, I do uh, remember speaking uh, quite often to John Schreiber and, and members of the team as Horizon has a, a, a long standing relationship with NJ Pack. Um, so thank you, everyone. We really appreciate uh, your insight, your, your presentations for today. We are now going to pivot to some questions, some Q&A. So um, let me just pull up the first question that came into us before today's webinar. And I have that from Renee on our team. So one of the questions for the group, um, what other resources would you recommend for nonprofit leaders and financial uh, leaders within these organizations? Are there, are there different websites, journals, other experts that they may want to uh, connect with to kind of stay up to date? And as I think all of you covered, there's so much volatility. And when you really look back to 2001 through today, uh, it's been a very challenging 20 plus years. Um, and how do board members or trustees, how can they be helpful as well. So what, what are some other resources or, or thoughts that you may have to help uh, build capacity for these organizations? And I'll just open it up to everyone. So I'll, I'll just throw out there from an investment standpoint and just kind of navigating things a little bit. Um, the CFA Institute has a lot of great resources for people that are not necessarily members that provide some guidance on investments and how to think about things. So if um, you've never been, you can go to the website, CFA institute.org, um, that, that's a great resource. And uh, uh, not to plug uh, PGM too much, but my colleague Rupal, who we work together on a number of things on focused on New Jersey, um, they have a great team and resources. So from an expert perspective, we leverage their team a lot. And so I think they're just right here in Newark in New Jersey, um, PGM is also a great resource. They have a ton of investment professionals that can help you navigate something. So 
those are my, that's my two cents. All right, thanks, Frank. Anyone else uh, please jump in? Sure. So my experience has, I've gotten the, uh, the best information from other performing arts centers. Uh, you know, we have a forum where uh, we have a collective of uh, art centers and that we meet on a regular basis, usually once a month, just to discuss what's going on in our business. And we, uh, I've gotten some very, very good help and advice from other centers. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, a couple of things I would I would add um, uh, to number one, the kind of going back to what I was talking about before in the presentation, I think for leaders who are looking for capacity support, really looking to your volunteer network and your boards as a place to add an additional capacity um, can give a really, really, really specific ask around projects. So some of those that we all of us have, have talked about here, I think could be helpful. The other place that may not be as um, obvious, but would be to actually talk to some of your funders particularly some of your, your larger funders and getting some of their advice. Um, I actually think right now, being a former funder by myself, this is a time where I think everyone understands there's a need to get creative. And I don't think it shows weakness. I think coming in, uh, having an open conversation about some of the, the needs an organization has that don't always require money, but maybe passing of social capital can be a really great way to build a better relationship with your funders as well. Yeah, maybe I'll just add, and, and Frank, thank you for that on PGM, but it's not just PGM, right? There's so many financial institutions you could talk to financial advisors, right? It's all about planning, I think, when it comes to your investments and, and you know, everything that everyone has said on today's webinar is creating that plan. And so these financial advisors will give you that insight and you don't necessarily even have to invest with them, right? They're, I think it's, you know, um, investment professionals' responsibility to give that type of insight and give you that type of transparency around what's happening in the financial markets, especially if you're not there um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, and I think some of you covered this already, but just to, just to put it back out there, um, how would you suggest getting started looking for earned revenue opportunities um, you know, moving forward? Maybe I can start and, you know, welcome others. Uh, Lenny, I think you have a lot of really great earned income uh, programs that, that you mentioned. The, first, the place that we often start with organizations is doing an asset map and really thinking about, or an asset inventory. What are the things that you're currently doing from both a programmatic standpoint, uh, things that might have an opportunity to be either grown um, or licensed or uh, commoditized is one way to think about it. Others to think about, fixed assets you might have. So if you have real estate holdings, if you have really unique or esoteric equipment that can be repurposed, um, uh, venue space, again, things that, again, are part of your, your, your balance sheet that we could think about. I think also one of the, the other places uh, to think about this too is how are some of the other um, actors in, in the, the ecosystem thinking about the, the value, again, that you're bringing to particular constituencies. And so what type of contracts, what type of partnerships can you build with other um, peer organizations or even other um, vendors, et cetera, that allow for you to kind of continue to do your, your programming, but allow you to build it in a way that um, doesn't rely on philanthropy, relies on, again, building a partnership through um, a different type of transactional income. I don't know, Lennon, if you, or others, if you have other thoughts. Uh, well, yes, those are, those, those are great suggestions. And, and what has been very successful for NJPAC has been our volunteer board. Uh, we have a, a very diverse board, especially uh, uh, people with expertise in real estate who have really been a, a guiding beacon to help us sort of explore what possibilities uh, could be. And we never really closed our, 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 our thinking to just performances. We look for uh, different ways and we explored all options that were presented to us. Great. Um, any other guidance for, for smaller nonprofits and you know, organizations that are under a million dollars or even under half a million dollars in terms of total organizational um, revenue annually? They have, you know, they may not have an endowment. They may not have um, those other resources. So, any specific guidance for those organizations? So, 
Tom, I'll, I'll, I'm John, I'll rather, I'll, I'll jump in and Tom, I'm sure you're going to, you're probably offering more value than me, but I, I am on a number of charity boards um, and one of the organizations here in Newark and we struggle, we're a small organization. Um, but what, what we work on and, and what I really, and I like what Tom said um, earlier, we're just thinking about earned income, but you think about from a revenue perspective, segment out where you're getting the revenue. So whether it's from individual comp uh, uh, individual donations, whether you're going to have events, and then um, whether or not you're going to have ongoing uh, type of grants that you receive, right? And bucket them out and create a financial plan. And then constantly kind of figure out where you have opportunity to grow and making sure you're diversifying those streams. Because I think, you know, if we wind up in a recession at some point in time, you know, you may have some of those revenue streams might decline. And so having a diversity in terms of where you're generating your revenue from is critically important for smaller institutions that may rely on one or two events a year for funding. So that's mm -hmm. that's been my experience. Yeah, no, I, I think that's I think that diversification piece in particular is 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 vital. I think um, just to just to add to one, just to affirm how hard uh, this is for smaller organizations. Like I, I I totally get it, and we work actually a lot of the groups we work with are under a million. Um, through, through some of our, our, our programs. When we talk with folks about this, I think one of the things we come back to is this idea of the value proposition. And I think it's a, I know it's kind of repurposing what I said before, but it really kind of get, gets to the heart of, of this, this question of what is, why does our organization matter right now in this, in this moment? And who cares that we're doing this work? And I think that begins kind of an interesting series of, of other questions and opportunities for groups to be able to go explore down. So, you know, thinking about that from that, that perspective, you may have individual donors or even like a foundation who's been uh, supporting a certain program. But if we start to think about this, the, the, the program from the lens of the beneficiary or even from why is this one donor always coming to support it? And we think about who else in the ecosystem cares that this program continues to happen that opens up a series of other cultivation opportunities. And, you know, there's a whole bunch of block and tackle things that I'm sure uh, Linda can talk through about, you know, donor cultivation and, and all of that. But I think beginning to open up the, the question of, we're bringing a lot of, as, as nonprofit leaders and organizations, a lot of value into our communities. And there's a whole host of, of constituencies that we may not have yet connected with who care about what we're doing. And so building pathways to some of those new, uh, constituencies, I think, can bear bear fruit. Great, thank you both. Anyone else like to comment on that particular question? So, I'd like to remind everyone the chat feature is open as well, and we have so far two questions. So we'll we'll get to those now. Um, can anyone recommend a resource of a sample investment policy and or statements that? Um, is free accessible does anyone have any of those resources that they can provide so um i would i would say that the earlier website i mentioned cfainstitute.org um they're the i think the gold standard and a lot of that so you can find those available but also um a lot of if you just google a lot of the investment management firms will have them available so i know vanguard has a sample on theirs morgan stanley has one on theirs um, and, you know, if you actually speak with any investment advisor, um, they would be able to provide you with a sample statement as well. Um, but if you want to kind of see that gold standard, it would probably be the CFA Institute, uh, in my opinion. Great. Thanks, Frank. Anyone else have any other thoughts or feedback? That's exactly what I would have said. If you Google investment policy, even for not for profits, um, or if you even walk into any of the financial investor uh, branches, um, you can talk through what, and they'll actually ask you these questions, right? Everything that we were all talking about today in terms of time horizon, diversification, risk appetite, um, they'll just ask you those questions and kind of create something for you live. Um, so definitely leverage those resources because, you know, they're, you know, in, in every town and um, in, especially in Jersey, there's so many, uh, there's a lot of presence out there. Great, thank you. 
Sure. In, in another option is that uh, if you go to a particular nonprofit's website and you look at their audited financial statement, they usually uh, speak about their investment policy in that. Excellent. Okay, we have um, one more question through the chat, and this is um, talking about how do nonprofits navigate, or really any business, but nonprofits specifically for this webinar, how do they navigate the rising cost of health insurance for their staff? Um, because that is, a, you know, it makes that organization more competitive when you want to retain and attract um, your staff. Uh, so, so I think this is in the context of just expenses in general, but you know specifically health insurance, and we know that th there's a rising cost um, coupled with inflation. So I'm not sure, Frank, if I want to put you on the spot or not. But sure. I had a feeling perspective with Horizon. Yes, absolutely. I had a feeling I was going to tackle that one, John, and <laughs> that's no problem. So. Um, you know, health insurance obviously is very costly, quite honestly, because the cost of health care is very expensive. And I think we see it day in and day out um, and it continues to go up. Um, so there's there's unfortunately there's no navigating just the, the, the cost of health care in general. That being said, you should look at products that help manage what your cost structure is and um, depending on the size of the organization. So, um, you know, if you're a small business, you can go to there's the exchange, the state exchange that you can go to. Um, you can also individually work with a broker to get that. Um, the other thing that you can do is there's there's new products in terms of whether or not, you know, there's new products called level select, where if you're a small business, you kind of self-insure with a limit up to a certain amount. And so if you kind of have a lower risk profile, um, you may be able to take advantage of that as well. So there's a number of different products. So what I would say is that if you're kind of using the same product every single year, you should evaluate whether or not that's the right product for you. And obviously someone at Horizon would be able to help you out, but there's also brokers across the state that, that do that as well. Um, and so that would be a way to, to reevaluate that. Um, and then, but the other thing I would say, just in terms of recruiting people, we're actually having this conversation at Horizon, believe it or not, John and I, we pay for health insurance, even though we work at Horizon and, and it goes up every single year as well. And uh, a lot of times employees really don't understand that that's part of their compensation structure. And so I wouldn't lose sight of the fact that communicating how much that you pay in benefits for your employees, that's part of their compensation. So don't just pay it, make sure the employees are aware of how much extra they're getting as part of their total compensation structure. I think that's something we lose sight of, we take it for granted. So that, that's my two cents. Sure, I will, yeah, I, I will say that uh, it, this is not an easy issue uh, for any company, especially uh, here at NJPAC. Uh, you know, we are very sensitive to providing people with uh, adequate health care. And although, you know, there are options where you can actually reduce the plan to save on costs, we've never taken that option. Uh, so part of the, uh, the, the issue for us is finding new ways to, to pay for that. Great. Thanks, Len. Anyone else on that particular topic? And I'll just echo what Frank said. There's there's many products that uh, insurers Horizon offers. Um, so whether it's direct with the company or a broker, um, there's there's ways to save money and have really great benefits for your employees. Uh, I want to thank the New Jersey Center for Nonprofits. They did post in the chat the uh, investment policy page from the National Council of Nonprofits. So that's there for everyone. There's a link there. Um, we do not have, I, I don't believe we have any other questions. Let me just check my text real quick. Um, okay, I, we do have one more and we have a few more minutes. So uh, question for everyone, what skills should a small nonprofit look for in board members uh, related to financial background? Is there, is there one type of skill set or looking at a diverse board member to recruit that can help in all of your financial planning, whether it's endowments, revenue, earned revenue, et cetera? So uh, any thoughts about recruiting? Lenny, you talked about your board, um, which is a terrific board. Our CEO, Gary St. Hilaire, is on your board, um, as you know. So um, any thoughts 
in terms of recruitment for board members? Yes, I would say you are looking to have a diverse board. Uh, the more diverse, uh, the better it is for the organization. So like in our, in our case, uh, you know, our board members come from various disciplines and they have all uh, provided uh, valuable insights to us in their area of expertise. So uh, go out and seek people with different skills. I would uh, add one other thought, um, which, and I, and I um, echo the, the point of diversity um, uh, on, on, all, on all factors. And I think one of the things that I would offer too, just to kind of with even within the finance profession is I would encourage having an entrepreneur, someone who's run a small business and someone who's deep in either finance or accounting, because those two are gonna be a good tension point. You're gonna have entrepreneurs who are gonna to wanna to push the envelope. You're gonna have your finance people who are gonna tell you if you can get it done and the accountant's gonna to wanna to know if you actually have the money to be able to pay for it, right? So <laughs> I think like having that mixture of perspective um, will be really helpful because that that healthy tension is what is gonna help. And you know, particularly in the moment now, I mean, I and I come more from the entrepreneurial lens, so I you know, advocate for that. But I think that's what's going to be needed when we think about how are we going to continue to innovate and deliver for our communities. We need to have that perspective, but we do need great finance people to tell us, you know, here's what the impacts of that are going to be. And, you know, maybe even some accountant support to be able to back up whether or not we're, um, yeah, we have everything that, that we need in place and what this is the, the overall impact of those decisions on our, our organizations. So. Anyway, hopefully that, that's just one other thought. Great, and, and uh, we do rely on Frank and our finance team to kind of keep us down the uh, straight and narrow uh, as much as we push. So, um, well, this was a terrific presentation. There's no additional questions. Um, I know it was extremely helpful for everyone who has joined us here today. I want to thank all of our presenters you were amazing. It's great to it's great to meet you as well. Um, I want to thank Linda and Yvonne, um, who kind of kicked off today's event. Everyone at the Center for Nonprofits who have, who's been a great partner with Horizon on many different fronts. I want to thank my entire team um, who's helped put this on. Jennifer, Renee, Philomena, uh, and Bridget. They did an amazing job coordinating and, and kind of managing this webinar series for us. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Um, enjoy the rest of your day. And uh, we look forward to working with you in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody.